Hello Eco Warriors. Welcome to the Institute of Urban Ecology. I'm Naomi. On today's episode, we're going to learn how to make our very own bee house, just like this. But wait, where does the honey go? And what do I do with the queen? Is there even a queen? Let's go get our supplies ready and find out. To make your bee houses, you're going to need acid and ink free paper cut into approximately 18 by 40 centimeter rectangles. You're also going to need a pair of scissors, maybe an X Acto knife, lots of masking tape, two elastic bands, paint, I prefer spray paint, something long and skinny to roll your paper tubes on and a clean and dry two liter pop bottle. Did you know that British Columbia is home to over 450 different species of native bees? And the honeybee isn't one of them. While we build our houses here together, I'm also going to talk about some of the types of bees that you can expect to find living in your homes. And you might be a little bit surprised to learn that they're pretty different from their famous relative, mm. the honeybee. The basic idea here is that you want to make as many of these paper tubes as possible. And you want to keep your tubes dry and protected from the sun. So to protect our tubes from the rain and the sun, we're going to use a painted two liter pop bottle, just like this. Now, if you want to get fancy, you can totally make the exterior of your bee house out of something like wood, or maybe you have a metal shop, whatever you have, that's totally fine. Just make sure that your house is deep enough that your tubes can fit all the way inside and stay nice and dry. Because if they get wet, they could, well one, they could fall apart, they could get moldy and your bees inside could get really, really sick and even die. And we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that our homes are a safe place for our bees to live and reproduce. And so in order to fit as many tubes into our house as possible, we're going to cut the top off of our bottles. But the trick here, don't cut the top off straight like this. Cut it on a bit of an angle. Here we go, of an angle like this so that the longer edge can act like a roof to shelter those tubes from the rain. So you can either cut it on an angle like this, or you can think about almost cutting like a little baseball visor. Get a nice close up there for you, like that. And so grab your scissors or your X-Acto knife, whatever works easiest for you. Go ahead and cut the top off your bottle and then we'll come back here for the next step. Once you have the top cut off your bottle, then you can go ahead and paint the exterior. Now that paint is not only going to make your bee house look pretty, it's also going to provide the bees with some really important shade from the sun's rays. And now we all have probably been inside a car with the windows rolled up on a really sunny day and you know how hot it can get inside. So if we just left these bottles clear, it could get really, really hot in there and that could be deadly to our bees. So once you get this one nice solid coat all around the outside, then you can decorate this however you want. I'm not very artistic, so I'm going to leave mine this nice teal color. And for this base coat, I do personally prefer to use spray paint. I find it goes on really quick. It dries really quick. It has like a really nice, even coverage and it binds to the plastic really, really well. And check out my little DIY spray paint station, you guys. Might look silly, but it works. So while our bottles are outside drying, 
I'm going to show you how to make the tubes for inside your house. Now this is probably the most important, also the trickiest step to building the bee houses. So grab your paper, grab your tape, maybe some elastic bands and some scissors, and let's get rolling. Okay, the most important thing when it comes to rolling the tubes for the bee houses is the size of the tubes or the diameter of the opening. And the really tricky part here is that you want to keep the diameter or the size of the opening of your tubes under eight millimeters wide, which is pretty, pretty tiny. To help me roll some nice tiny tubes, I am going to use this bamboo stick. You can just get these at a local dollar store. I'm also going to try one out with one of these chopsticks like this. First off, let's try one out with the bamboo stick. I have my um, acid free ink free paper here cut into my 18 by 40 centimeter uh, rectangles approximately. I'm just going to turn this bamboo stick around here. And what I find the trick here and uh, the more practice you have, the better you'll get at this. So again, just stick with it. Don't give up. But I find it's easiest if you hold the paper and the stick up off the table rather than rolling like this. Hold it up in your hands and kind of crease the paper along the bamboo stick like so. So it kind of makes a bit of a flag that will kind of help you out a little bit. And then all you're going to want to do is sort of squish the paper in between your fingers and your hands and roll. So squish and roll, squish and roll, making sure that tube is nice and tight. And you're going to roll it all the way up like that. And then you can kind of take a look and you can kind of see, you can kind of judge looking at it, whether or not you think you might need to try and roll again. And I'm looking at this one and I think that this opening here might just be a little bit too big. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take the paper off the stick and you can either roll it like this again, or I find it's kind of helpful sometimes if you flip the paper so that that looser, the last edge that you had rolled last time will now be the first kind of inside edge of the tube. And again, I'm going to kind of press or crease the paper around the bamboo stick. And then again, use my fingers and just squish and roll. Squish and roll. Okay, now this doesn't look like the best one either, but for time's sake, we're gonna give it a go. So I've got a couple of pieces of masking tape that I've already ripped off and placed on the edge of the table to make this easier as well. And so I'm going to tape one end of my tube here like that, and then carefully wiggle the bamboo stick out. And I'll tape the other end like that. Now this actually doesn't look too, too bad. So that actually turned out pretty good. And I've had lots of practice um, with this. And then you might notice that when you're rolling that your paper might lift up a little bit here. If that's the case, I do like to tape that down just again to keep any mites or parasite, other parasites, mold and fungus out. I will kind of seal that off like so. 
there's one down. Now, I did find when I was experimenting the other day that using a chopstick like this actually worked out really, really well because it's almost kind of squared off. And with this little kind of end bit here, you can almost kind of turn it like a screwdriver while you're rolling. And so I'll show you what that looks like here. Again, I've got my paper already cut. I'm going to do the same thing here where I crease the paper along the chopstick. Start off with a little squeeze and roll. And then once you get started, you can almost just hold the paper with one hand, squeezing down, and you can twist the back end of the chopstick like this, and it'll start to kind of wind up along the chopstick like so, and then it gets really nice and tight on there, and that's really, really snug on there, so I'm pretty sure that's going to be less than eight millimeters in diameter, and so I'm going to tape that down there. And there you have it. This one turned out even smaller than the last. This one's about five millimeters in diameter, and so that is great. But again, I've got kind of this little lift in the paper here. You'll find that happens with the chopstick because it does taper at the end, which is okay. I'm just going to tape that down like this again. Like so, and voila. Now, if you find while you're rolling, and this will probably happen to you more than once, one end of your tube usually turns out really well, nice and small, and then the back end sometimes kind of flares out and gets too wide. If that's the case, all you have to do is you can close off this bigger end with another piece of tape, and that'll help keep any uh, predators or parasites from squeezing their way in there and keep your bees nice and safe again. So we can just close that up like so. And there you have it. I made it look pretty easy, you guys, but uh, stick with it, practice, and you'll be a pro in no time too. All right? So while you keep rolling as many of these tubes as possible, I'm going to talk a little bit more now about the types of bees that we can expect to find living in our houses, those native British Columbia bees. I should mention that a lot of bee houses come pre-made and use things like these here with holes drilled into blocks of wood or even wooden tubes. And now these will work. Your bees will use these houses. However, the added benefit to rolling your own paper tubes is that we can open these up come winter and clean and take care of our bee cocoons. But that's another episode, so stay tuned for that. For now, let's get back to the bees. Like I said in the beginning, honeybees are not native. Honeybees were introduced to North America as a farmed agricultural animal, just like dairy cows or lamb chops. Honeybees are social, they live together in a hive with a queen, and only the queen makes babies. They also, of course, make honey, which is pretty cool considering only about 5% of all bee species on Earth actually make honey. Now let's talk about our native bees, the ones you can expect to find living in your bee houses. First off, they were not introduced by humans. This is their wild, natural home. They have evolved and adapted to the climate here and do not need the help of a bee farmer to survive our winters. Most of our native bees are solitary, aka not social. They do not live together in a hive. They do not make honey and there is no queen. This is important because that means every female bee is responsible for making babies. Why have you never seen one of these 450 bee species before? Well, you may not have recognized them, but
because a lot of these bees don't even look like their famous black and yellow striped honeybee. Meet the sweat bees. They come in some beautiful metallic colors. See the pollen stuck to the sweat bees' legs? Their legs are covered in tiny hairs called scopa. Bees use their scopa to carry pollen around with them. Female sweat bees mostly build their nests in the ground, but you might find a few living in your bee house as well. Your bee houses will most likely be occupied by hairy belly bees. Hairy belly bees come in three varieties, mason bees, leaf cutter bees, and wool cutter bees. They get their name because their scopa is on the underside of their bellies or abdomens, not their legs. The scientific name for these bees is Megachilidae, but I like to call them the mega pollinators because one of these bees can pollinate 65 times more flowers than a single honeybee. Any idea why? You got it. Hairy belly bees have more scopa on their belly than a honeybee does on their legs, so they're simply able to carry more pollen at once. But also, remember that most of these bees are solitary, meaning they live alone and every female lays eggs, not just the queen. Teamwork makes the dream work, and when you have hundreds of worker honeybees working together to support one queen bee, those workers really don't have to work all that hard. But our solitary bees have to do all this work themselves. Each female bee needs to build and stock her own nest. Male bees simply fertilize the eggs and then buzz off. See ya! The male's goal is to fertilize as many eggs as possible, and the female's goal is to lay as many eggs as possible. So the more pollen she collects, the more eggs she can lay. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but first, some other local bee species you might find in your bee house or in your garden are carpenter bees, squash bees, and mining bees. Now, most of these bees prefer to build their nests underground, but you still might find a couple in your bee house too. All of our solitary bees are very non-aggressive and very unlikely to sting you. Unlike honeybees, where it is some bee's job to protect the hive, their honey, and the queen, solitary bees don't have to worry about protecting those things. The only job they're really concerned with is collecting pollen. What is actually going on inside your bee house? Imagine you took one of your tubes that you're rolling and split it open lengthwise. This is what it would look like inside. The first thing each female bee is going to do is close the back end of the tube with mud or leaves if you're a leaf cutter bee. This will help keep our baby bees safe from predators, parasites, mold, and fungus. See all that yellow stuff? You guessed it. That's all pollen that the female bee has collected. That little white thing there? That's an egg. Each egg gets its own room with its own supply of pollen. The female bee is going to repeat this process over and over until your tube is totally full. And if she still has enough life left in her, she'll find another tube and do it over and over again until the day she dies. See now why there are better pollinators than honeybees? What is all that pollen for? Well, when the egg hatches, the little bee larva is going to eat up all that pollen. When the pollen is all gone and the larva is big and fat, it's going to roll up into a cocoon for winter, just like a caterpillar would. Next spring, the cocoons will hatch and your new solitary bees will emerge and the life cycle will start all over again. There are some things that you can do to help your bee cocoons over winter. Keep your bee houses out until October, November-ish, and subscribe to our channel. When the time is right, we'll show you how to clean and protect your cocoons till next spring. So why does the world need bees? Well, I'm sure you've heard it all before. Pollination. But not all flowers need bees to pollinate. Some can self-pollinate and some can wind pollinate. So those types of flowers don't actually attract many bees. 
Coming up in another episode, we're going to talk more about the types of flowers that attract bees and other pollinators, so stay tuned for that. Our native bees may have evolved and adapted to survive in beautiful British Columbia, but one thing they weren't prepared for is how humans have altered our urban ecosystems. There are many threats out there to our native bees, and building a bee house is a great way to help. But there are lots of other things you can do to make your garden more pollinator friendly as well. But that's another episode. So there you have it, you guys. Your very own DIY bee house. And now the question I always get at the end of these workshops is, where is the best place and what's the best time to put my bee house out? And I was told the best time to put these out is when the cherry blossoms bloom, but really any time um, kind of early to mid spring is best. But you know, you'll still get bees coming in here and using these all throughout the summer months as well. So don't worry if you're a little late getting your house out. I'm sure you'll still get some bees in there, mostly probably those leaf cutter bees. A good place to put your bee house is somewhere where it gets early morning sun. So those bees can get nice and warm, warmed up in the mornings. So they can take off and go to work, but also where it's nice and shaded in the afternoon. Those sun's rays are just a little bit too intense sometimes. So early morning sun, afternoon shade is great. And put it as close to your flower garden as possible. These bees are, they're working hard out there. So the less that they have to travel from the flower to their home, that's going to really help them out a lot. And keep your house safe. Be aware of any other potential predators or dangers in your neighborhood. Maybe you have a, a dog in the neighborhood, a neighbor's cats or lots of raccoons. So put it somewhere where it's not going to get accidentally knocked down, but it's still close for the bees and easy for them to find and uh, protected from that afternoon sun as well. And so coming up in a couple episodes or two, we are gonna have a little workshop on uh, pollinator friendly gardens, pollinator friendly plants, how else to be bee friendly. So these are some things to look forward to in the future. But while you wait for those you guys, I'd love to see your bee houses and I'd love to see any pictures of any bees that you can find. Maybe we can work together to help identify which species you have in your houses. And so please share all your pictures, comments uh, in any of our social media. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram. So take some pictures, tag us in them. We'd love to see your bees and your bee houses. Until next time, you guys, thanks for tuning in. Bye now.